Well, Megan, I've been wearing Vionic shoes for over three years now, but this month, my trusted shoe brand and I entered a new phase of our relationship, international travel. Well, Sarah, that is a serious commitment, (laughs) right? You can't just pack any shoe for a trip abroad. It's got to be stylish enough for those major cosmopolitan cities. It's got to be sturdy enough for trains, planes, buses, and city streets. And obviously, it's got to be comfortable enough to support your feet over many, many miles of walking. Well, no surprise, my Vionics were up to the task. I had two pair with me, a pair of casual sneakers in a cool gray color, and then a weatherproof suede ankle boot that I swear still looks brand new after 10 days on soggy sidewalks. Megan, the only time my feet hurt the entire trip was New Year's Eve when I made the mistake of wearing a pair of booties not from Vionic. So I'll just leave that data right here for you. Okay, well, that's pretty conclusive, Sarah. Vionic has the best curated styles to get you ready for whatever 2024 has in store, whether it's jet setting like Sarah or keeping up with busy mom life on this side of the pond. They even offer a 30 day guarantee, wear them, love them or return them for a full refund within 30 days. And we've got a great deal for you. Use code the mom hour 15 at checkout for 15% off your entire order at vionicshoes.com when you log into your account. That's a one time use only. Bionic Shoes, wearable well-being for your feet. Hi, I'm Sarah. And I'm Megan. We're two moms with eight kids between us, from little to grown. We're in different areas of the country and in different stages of life. But we both know that motherhood's a lot easier when real moms share tips and encouragement. And remind you that it's really all going to be okay. We're not experts. We're parents who've been there. We're not perfect. We're real. Welcome to the Mom Hour. Hey, everyone, and welcome to episode 295 of the Mom Hour. I am Megan Francis here, as always, with Sarah Powers. Hey, Sarah. Hey, Megan. Hey, like episode 295, we're getting really close to 300, and that's just the numbered ones. I know. And that, yeah, I think it's like over 500 of all of them, but we've lost count. And last week, I think I said to you before we recorded last week, it's starting to remind me of like interstates. Like, I feel like there's some Chicago... Some Chicagoland interstates, 290, 294. I don't know. I don't know where yep. we're headed. Is it Iowa? Is it Wisconsin? I don't know where we're heading across the country, I guess. And <laughs> and it's also like losing track of numbers is also a great tie in with our topic for today because um, it's post holiday. Yeah. And I think a lot of us are losing track of a number of objects. Uh-huh. See what I did there? Yep. So we're here to talk about that today in part two of our where do we put all this stuff series. Is that what we're calling us? Where do we put it all? Yeah, where to, where to put all the things. Actually, it's where yes. to put all the stuff. And this is part two. Yeah. So last week we talked about um, some basic toy categories that we've all kind of gone through with child's play things like big plastic toys and little plastic toys. <laughs> and Lego, which falls and under Lego. little plastic little toys, plastic. but of its own things with wheels. universe. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Things with wheels, things with faces. Like we had a, we talked about a lot of those kinds of things last week. And I think this work we're moving this week, we're moving more into like, um, stuff that is still kind of in the plaything category sometimes, but it's just a little broader, like family life stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we didn't mean to do it this way, but I would almost say that last week's categories tend to be things kids, um, get as a gift for just themselves, um, and may or may not share. Although we talked about, you know, Lego and my family is kind of a shared thing. But this week, I think it's really uh, communal stuff like art supplies and board games and things that everybody uses. And I do think that makes a difference when you think about where to store stuff. And and there are also categories that I think stay with us for longer. I mean, last week we talked about how giant plastic push walker toys, you know, it's an annoying phase, but it's a relatively short one, whereas books are with you your entire, you know, your entire life. So, yeah, I'm excited about this one. Me too. Me too. Very much looking forward to it. Well, um, before we kind of get into the tips, I was, I I thought a lot about last week because we got a lot of feedback everywhere in our email inboxes and the Facebook group and on Instagram, especially. Um, And it almost felt like last week was a little bit more of like a a mindset session or a therapy session around stuff as opposed to like, okay, everyone here is the best number one way to store your Lego. I, I feel like there's the internet for that. There's Pinterest for that. Right. And not not to be dismissive of anybody's question, but you and I probably aren't ever going to be prescriptive about where to put your crayons. But we can tell you all the ways in which crayon storage has like manifested yes. in our homes. Um, so I don't know. I thought maybe before we move on today, we could just kind of 
reflect on last week. If you haven't listened to last week, I do recommend it. Although I think you could listen out of order. I think it doesn't have to be in order. Me too. Um, but a couple of things that as I looked back, like real big points that I wanted to bring out. Um, the first one was that you and I both spoke to our kids having such different styles of play with their things over the years. So some kids really like and need order. And they're the ones who get all bent out of shape when, you know, something's not in rainbow order or the Lego set breaks or they can't find their calico critter spoon. Somebody in the Facebook right. group said, have you ever tried to find a calico critter spoon in a gray carpet? And I was like, yes. it was so good. That made me laugh. But other kids mix and match their make believe and actually like structure kind of pens them in a little. And sometimes siblings play really well and you can kind of like put all the magnet tiles in one bin and other other family sets might need to keep things separate. So. I think the point is, is learning how your kids play with their things is really pretty fundamental to thinking about how you store them and organize them, which just goes back to there is no one right way. But looking to your kids and I loved what you said specifically about like even very young kids may have opinions and even aesthetic and design choices about how they organize their stuff. So, um, yeah, yeah, I just wanted to bring that up again. Um, Another thing I thought of, and I I don't know if I said it clearly last week, um, is that the storage system that is going to work is the one that you can stick to and really use reliably. So if it is your goal as a mom not to be the only one cleaning up forever, like today, tomorrow, and all of the rest of your days, I would just think really carefully about putting systems in place that are hard for everybody else to remember or read or keep track right. of. And like, I get it. I get the temptation to color code things and like have things. I mean, I like that. That's my personality too. But I think for me, I've had to learn a balance that if I want my family's help, um, I have to think about the system that we're all going to be able to reliably use every day. Like, okay, guys, it's time to pick up the toys. If everybody knows what to do when I say that and jump in and where things go, then we've got a good system, even if that system doesn't look as pretty as maybe you'd want. So those were kind of the the high level ones for me. Yeah. And I think, you know, to your point before about um, keeping in mind that your kids may play very differently or use objects very differently. Also, they may use them in very different places. Like you may have one child who really likes to spend time in their room. um, Mm -hmm you know, crafting or playing with their little, their little toys. And the other one might like to do that in the living room, or they might share a bedroom. Like there's so much specific about your space that determines this and the way your family uses your space as well. And I think I may have come off last week. Like I was saying that buying bins or purchasing a system is a bad idea. And I don't believe that. I just think, um, until you know what the problem areas are and then have a good sense of your space and how, you should use it before you go shopping. Mm-hmm. You're just going to go into one of those organization stores and mm-hmm. your jaw is going to drop. It's like manna from heaven. I mean, even mm-hmm. for someone like me, who's yeah. not as systems oriented, it's fun. It's so pretty. And you can drop. It's so pretty. And it gives you this idea about what your house will look like if you buy these things. And sometimes like the fantasy in your head does not match up with the reality. So you spend all this money and you get home and you don't have a logical way to use the bins or the baskets or whatever the containers. And so then they become clutter, right? right. So like if it's almost like you can do this really slowly, you can start with one new system, one new bin, try it out, see if it works, see where it works. Um how does everyone interact with it and then add on and and I do think some of those modular systems that stick around for a long time are great for that rather than going someplace where you're not sure next time you go to that store that that system will still be there. It's yeah. sometimes nice to go to one of those tried and true stores that you know, they've got this system. It's been around forever. It's not going anywhere. That gives you a little opportunity to try one size. Did you like that size? Mm-hmm. Maybe now you need six of those sizes, but yeah. uh, like, it's hard to know that six is the magic number. Yep. I totally agree. <laughs> Until you've tried. Yeah, I totally agree. And yeah, I, I'm glad that you brought that up because I think um, after we did the episode, I went on Instagram and showed how chaotic our Lego situation has been for years. And same thing, mm-hmm. like, I I don't, I hope neither of us came across as like poo-pooing, you know, more structured systems, but exactly what you said, knowing what, knowing what you really need and knowing your family can stick to it um, probably is more important than how pretty the system is. So I'm looking forward this week to showing my art supplies on Instagram stories because I think they will be much um, less stress-inducing for people than when I showed the Legos. So. 
Well, and Sarah, a few times last week, you also mentioned leaning in on things that aren't fancy, like little Tupperware containers or Ziploc bags. Like yeah. it doesn't have to be gorgeous. And you can get a lot of a lot of mileage out of those kind of cheap, like, oh my gosh, I have a jar in the, like that jar that looked like a good jar. So I didn't toss it in the recycling bin. You know, we all have yeah. one of those. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like We threw it in the dishwasher. Oh, wow. We could put beads in that. That's great. And it doesn't have to be matchy matchy for it to do the job. I just like to think of it as farmhouse rustic. I love farmhouse rustic. And I think that was probably one of the biggest takeaways from last week is whether you want them to be pretty containers or you don't care, subdividing larger bins and baskets into something like Tupperware, Ziploc bags, little um, ball jars, anything that can help contain the smaller pieces within a larger set. We talked about like Barbie shoes or Calico food or you know, the, the Lego minifigure weapons that they always, you know, the kids want to know where those are. So, um, subdividing, I think was like a good, uh, practical tip that came out of last week. So Sarah, you know, when someone's trying to sell me something, I can be pretty skeptical. Maybe it's my rebel tendencies, but having some healthy doubts has definitely kept me from wasting money on every cool product. The algorithm sends my way. You know, what's not too good to be true though. Our sponsor ritual and they're clinically backed essential for women, 18 plus multivitamin. Yeah, Megan, that's so true. We both love these vitamins because they're made with high quality and traceable key ingredients in clean bioavailable forms. And they're gentle on an empty stomach with a fresh minty essence in every bottle. So you don't have to worry about nausea if you're a bit relaxed about when you take them. I'm also a big fan of Ritual's sustainability standards. They use scientific tools to select lower carbon packaging, prioritize sustainably sourced ingredients, and set ambitious climate goals. No more shady business. Ritual's Essential for Women 18 Plus is a multivitamin you can actually trust. Get 20% off your first month for a limited time at ritual.com slash the mom hour. Start Ritual or add Essential for Women 18 Plus to your subscription today. That's ritual.com slash the mom hour for 20% off. We are welcoming a new sponsor today, Dr. Mom Butt Balm. Sarah, this might sound a little weird, but when my kids were babies, I actually really enjoyed changing diapers. It felt like a little time out to connect. Oh yeah, Megan, I can totally remember that feeling of just kind of leaning in and enjoying a little moment in your routine. Yeah, but when my babies had diaper rash, it made the whole experience so much less fun for both of us. And back in those days, we didn't have great options for rash cream either. It was usually goopy, heavy, and full of dyes and preservatives and other things I didn't really want to put on my baby's butt. Well, the creator of Dr. Mom Butt Balm, who is a mom and also a doctor, had the same experience, Megan, and she did something about it. Dr. Mom Butt Balm is free of dyes, preservatives, and zinc oxide. It's easy to apply, easy to remove, and you don't have to use a lot to protect your baby's skin. I really love the way this balm feels. It's almost like a high-end skin cream. Very nice, no strong scent, and definitely nothing like the diaper rash creams I used to struggle with. Don't let diaper rash come between you and your baby. Shop for Dr. Mom Butt Balm online at Amazon or Walmart today. Okay, so arts and crafts is a huge topic, and let's just acknowledge that we know that this covers everything from like your toddler's very first little play-doh and stickers and things that they're getting into all the way up through Megan, you and I have tweens who are really into like pretty high end art supplies. So we can't like, we have to kind of make some generalizations here, but um, I think a lot of these things work. And so I'll dive in. Um, In general, in my house, it has worked well to have kind of two big categories of art supplies. Those that the kids have free access to anytime they want um, they just grab them and and make and draw and do whatever. And then another category of things that they would need to ask me first. Now, what's interesting as I think back is what belongs in each category has changed. Like paint used to 100% be something they would need to ask me. And I'd probably put newspaper down on the table and I'd probably supervise and this and that. And now they can paint without asking for permission because they're older and they they can they can manage it. So things have moved from one category to the other. But the way I store things and organize things definitely feeds right into that, right? Because I, when they were younger and smaller, I wanted them to have free and, you know, open access to a lot, but not to everything. Um, and so you might, that might look different in every family, but that worked well for us. Um, one tip I have is to consider culling and um, pruning your art supplies more often than you think. 
and let the kids help. So what's interesting is most kids don't like to throw away the things they've made with art. They don't want to throw away their beautiful pictures. They don't want to throw their Play-Doh creations. But my kids haven't had a problem throwing away actual art supplies that don't work anymore. So we make a big game out of like getting every marker out at once and getting a huge piece of paper and testing them and see which ones don't work and just like very happily throwing them away. Um, throwing away broken crayons or you can do that cute Pinteresty craft where you melt them down. I have done yeah. that. That's fun. Um, but getting rid of crayons that are shorter than like a half a crayon, getting rid of Play-Doh that's like frustratingly dry. Like you think it's still good, but really you can't work with it. It's starting to get crusty. Yeah. yeah. Just um, yeah. throw those things away with abandon rather than try to hold on to them. Because I think what you'll find is kids will make more art with fewer supplies that are in good shape. It's sort of like the capsule wardrobe, you know, like conversation, yes. like yep. you can do more when you have fewer choices, but they're all really good choices. Um, I want to interject on that please. really quick because we had several questions on Instagram about dealing with Play-Doh and I believe crayons and markers. And I think that sometimes we make the mistake of trying to front load by buying every color we could ever use or like mm -hmm. every, you know, and Play-Doh comes in like 24 colors if you buy those little tiny ones and crayons come in what, 128 colors. I mean, there is such a thing as purchasing too much upfront rather than spreading it out through the year. So if you were looking at it as like, um, not like a budget thing, because most of these are pretty cheap, yeah. but like, um, if you're looking at more like a, how much of, how much of my life am I willing to spend buying these things or mm -hmm. whatever, like spread it out over the whole year. Don't think of it as something you're going to buy once and then rebuy in a year. Yeah. It makes a lot more sense to buy brand new, fresh stuff every two months when they're at that stage, especially with Play-Doh. Yeah, I would agree. Um, and, and yeah, sometimes we conflate the cost. I mean, many of these things are very inexpensive relative to other things we'd buy our kids. So yeah, I love that. Um, glitter was just let, n literally never an option in when my kids were making art when they were younger. And I know we've laughed about that, but I think it's okay if you are just not the house where painting happens or glitter happens or like you you're still the, you're still the grown up as we like to say you are it, you're still in charge so if there's like some some no go categories of arts and crafts that you just prefer they wait till they're in preschool or they wait till they go to a birthday party i think that's okay i have to interject on that really quick too of course. glitter glue um or glittery uh uh, I mean, glue sticks glue, yeah are well those are an option like those are a way to kind of let your kids have the feeling of glitter. Yeah. Without glitter that can go everywhere and then glitter outside. That was those are just the two ways that I dealt with glitter because I also did not want like jars of glitter getting, oh you know, gosh. loose glitter loose that would glitter. get into everything. Yeah. Um but like that glittery glue stick, it's yeah. like, "Oh, it's shiny, it's sparkly, but yet it doesn't go anywhere." Yeah. Just yeah. Turns that there's those a tip. Good. Yeah. Yeah, those are good. Yeah. Um okay, let's talk about crayons and and marker and pencil storage real quick cuz I noticed a change when I thought back on this. When my kids were smaller, what I loved was a wide flat box or a bin um for crayons or markers or pencils so that they were all laid flat inside and the kids could kind of dig through for the colors they wanted. Um Megan, can you picture those Melissa and Doug like puzzles or toys that would come in those kind of light balsa I don't know if it's balsa wood. It's a light yeah, I totally know what you're talking about. And yep. it becomes it almost looks like it could be reused as a drawer separator or a mm -hmm. caddy. So those make great storage for crayons and pencils because I mean they're free. You've already have them in your house and they're very flat. And that is what we use for years and years and years. Um and now that my kids are older, they actually use like I use jars or soup cans. I reuse, you know, just upcycle those jars and soup cans. And we I do actually sort the markers and pencils into color groups, which is like so satisfying for my brain, but it would never have worked <laughs> years ago. And the kids will they actually they not only stick to it, they actually prefer it because they can see all the colors at once. So just an example of something that can change so drastically depending on the ages. And I think I remember when Allegra was two and someone gave her a little Lazy Susan from Pottery Barn with cute paint can style pencil storage. But she never we never used it because she needed to like dump crayons out and see them all at once. But now the age that my kids are, we can do cute storage things like that. So it really yeah. depends on maturity level. So. Um, and then a couple more quick tips. One is that we've always had what I call a mixed media bin. That's like basically a treasure box of ribbon, yarn, stickers, popsicle sticks, clothespins, puff balls. It's kind of purposely chaotic because you just have to dig through. And I will go through every once in a while and get garbage out. Like a lot of times the kids will put their little crumpled sticker, the backings <laughs> to stickers back in yep. there. 
But otherwise, it's not organized at all. It's like it is like a scrap, a scrap bin if you were a, you know, a knitter or a sewer or something like that. And so that has always and that's worked for all age groups. Um, so that's a fun one. Um, and then another basket that I've started more recently is a work in progress basket or bin. And I, I think I got this from a teacher or teacher classroom or something idea. Um, but that's just for those things that they're not ready to part with yet. But like you're not going to hang on the fridge either. Like it's not precious to you, but you know right. they're going to notice if you throw it away. So we just have a big work in progress basket. Um, and what I like about it is half the stuff in there is even like 3D, like pa- reads paper airplanes and origami. And it's not organized at all. It's not like doesn't have cute file dividers. It is. It looks like a garbage pile to me, but it is not a garbage pile to my children. And then eventually, <laughs> like one day when I'm feeling motivated and they're in good moods, I can just say, hey, guys, can you go through the work in progress basket and just truly if you're working on something, leave it in there. But the rest can go in the trash or in the recycling. And usually at these ages, they're, they're okay with that now. So yeah, I feel like that was a whole lot, but it was a lot of tips. Those were what came up for me. Yeah. Well, I have three things. I have a conversation starter. Okay. A question and a tip. I love it. I'm going to start with the question. Okay. Um, actually, no, I'm going to start with the complaint and the complaint (laughs) is why, like, I don't know if this is just my family, but like the biggest, um, Thing that has never been something we can keep a handle on and it doesn't seem to fit are scissors. Oh my gosh. There's never scissors when one needs scissors. And when one finds scissors, said scissors must always have gummy substances oh, right. yeah. upon the blades. And I, I have learned to have my own scissor stash that is like not something my kids could even find because there's someone always sniffing around. Well, you would have to hide it. Otherwise, they will just become the kid's scissors. Like there's no, they will be in your possession for like a half a second. Yeah. And I would go out and buy like four or five different pairs of like little kid hand-sized craft scissors and they would just be gone. And then they would all turn up one at a time Mm -hmm. when you don't need them. So I'm just putting that out there as one of those universal things that even when I had a bin where all the art supplies went, somehow the scissors always made their way out and didn't wind up back in that bin. They never stayed in the pencil yeah. jar. Like I could just, there was just never a great solution for that. And we're kind of past it now. We're not at the stage anymore where there's a lot of that kind of stuff going on. But like, I would love to hear if anyone out there has mastered scissors. Cause I just feel like it's a, it is a category that just is beyond me. Well, let me so, jump in super fast and ahead. say that when yeah. we moved and I organized all of our art supplies, I probably found 12 pairs of kid scissors. <laughs> and I did, I, I created an entire small bin I will show a picture of it just for scissors, because I think what I used to do is like tuck it in a multi-purpose. Like it was like there was one pair of scissors in every project area. Now I do have one bin that literally has 10 or 12 pairs of small scissors in it. And that has helped because someone can wander off with one and there are still more. Now, it it has not solved them stealing my scissors because my kids are getting a little old for kids scissors. So they (laughs) will they'll bypass the 12 the bin of 12 and go right. Right. And they'll go for yours. But it was helpful to just, just admit that we need 10 pairs of scissors and just have a whole bin for them. So we And like with like, I I do like that. And also it also gives them more like responsibility. If they get down to somehow magically to the last (laughs) pair of scissors, they know there's no scissors left after that. They can't even delude themselves. All right. Well, I just, I had to complain and I'm sure a lot of people out there get it as did you, Sarah. Um, here's the conversation starter. And that is, um, like really let's talk about at what ages your kids have had their own art supplies, if ever. Um, or if you're the kind of family who they always will have a communal bin or shared can or whatever. So I would say in my house at different times, totally communal worked great, but I did notice there were a few kids in my house that had very different respect levels for things like not pressing hard with crayons or not peeling labels off the crayons, or I could think of a million other things, cleaning the glue off the tip of the glue bottle. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And some kids cared about it so much that it made sense for them to have like their own little area or their own little supply. Um, Those kids also cared enough about it to take good care of their stuff. And that I think is the difference. Like they don't get to complain if they're not going to be part of the solution, I guess. (laughs) But I'm just wondering if that was a thing for you with arts and crafts or anything really. I mean, we're going to talk about books later. I can see that being a thing with books, um, board games. There's lots of things where certain kids are just going to use them differently. And I think it's interesting to set that up as a premise that you kind of have to make these decisions based on. Yeah. 
I think in our house, we by far the majority of things have been communal. And I'm trying to think of why it worked. And I'm coming back to the probably the hardest years were when Violet was a toddler and wasn't ready for some of the right. supplies that the big kids were. But it wasn't so much. A, it was more just I needed to find alternatives for her. Like we might have had some nicer acrylic paints or some some craft paints and I and I would have had to make her happy with finger paints or watercolor. So I do remember that as more of a parenting challenge in terms of the kids feeling proprietary or kind of specific. I don't think we've dealt with that as much until Allegra got into, you know, really technical art. And I know Clara has been, too. And then those things have stayed in her room and she's able to do art in her room. But that was really not until age 10 or 11. So I think we made it through with mostly communal things for a long time. Okay. well, I'm I'm curious if that's going to be something that comes up as we're going through, you know, more uh, of these categories, either for us or for listeners at home. So I'm just I wanted to raise that. And great point. And then that kind of leads to my final thought on arts and crafts supplies. Um, And I, again, I think this could apply to a lot of different categories, but this one was particularly in my house is that again, with like the, there's, there's a way we would like it to work um, (laughs) for our own aesthetics, our own comfort levels. But I, I did have a child who really thrived in like a controlled chaos art situation. And I decided pretty early to accommodate that. Because it was such a thing for her. It was Clara. Mm -hmm. Um, And it kind of reminded me of our conversation last week about Lego. Like some kids are perfectly happy just getting all the stuff out. And then like either it's Lego and building or getting out the art supplies and drawing and coloring and painting. They do it for an hour and then they just kind of put it all away. And maybe they have something half done that's out. But it's like very containable and systematical. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's not a word, but I used it anyway. But I just feel like some kids need a space to just spread out. And it's their creative space that they want to have some discretion Mm -hmm. over. And of course, it's ultimately your decision. If if there's no space in your house where it works to do that, you kind of, they got to figure out a way to work with you. But I just made a decision when Clara was like maybe three or four years old that like to whatever extent possible, she was just going to have her own space, like a Mm -hmm. half of a table that was off in a side room or a bit of shelf or like something she just didn't have to worry about keeping clean. So Mm -hmm. we would do like a weekly tidy where we'd throw away, you know, all those random paper cuttings or like you mentioned the backings of stickers or Mm -hmm. scrub up crayon off the window if she had gotten a little uh, too creative. Mm -hmm. But mostly it was just her space to use the way she liked. And it in the end made my job easier, which Mm -hmm. is why I liked it. Mm -hmm. Like I had to, when I walked through that room, that space had to become a blur. Like I didn't even see it. Mm Mm-hmm. Like yeah. Scanning the room. All I see is like that space just doesn't, it's not there. It's like white noise. Um, and I could describe those spaces in the last few homes we've lived in, like the one we're in now she's it's just in her bedroom. She doesn't need to spread out all over the house. The last house we lived in was teeny tiny. And she had, again, it was, she was a little bit younger, but she had a little easel in her room. But the two houses before that one, she had like most of a bench that kind of took up this entryway room. And she did deface it terribly. And mm-hmm. when we moved, we had to paint because, I mean, she had like written um, R.I.P. Scotty Cheese Hands all <laughs> over in crayon and drawn pictures of her dead hamster. And it was just like out of control. But I had just decided that was going to be OK. And then before that, there was like this little it was an old house and there was like this little sunroom off of the dining room. And we basically moved a table in there just for her to mess up. Mm-hmm. And I just didn't deal with it. So she's still kind of like a real life version of like pig pen. Mm-hmm. Um, only with crayons floating around her head, but she's bigger now. So it's, it's easier to keep it contained. I just mm-hmm. think that was a very conscious decision for me. And I'm yeah. glad I did that Yeah. in the end. So we got a few people who sent us either an Instagram or email pictures of their kids art areas and just saying like, what do I do about this? And I think I'm so glad you kind of went through that, painted that mental picture, Megan, because again, it's not so much about the right caddy or the right system as kind of deciding, is this a permanent installation? And if so, is it serving my kid? Because, you know, kids, kids will, like I said, they'll do a lot more art with a well curated selection. So maybe your kids art area does need a little pruning, but if it doesn't, and it's just, it just looks chaotic. Then I think a great question is to kind of ask, like, can I accept this for now? Or if not, what could we do to make it acceptable for me. So I love that. And one thing I just to pop in on that really quick. One nice thing about having that space be out in the open is that it gave me more ability, even though it was annoying because it was in front of me all the time. It gave me more ability to help mm-hmm. keep it 
under control for her. Whereas now that it's in her room, I have to go in her room and say, do you have any idea over your colored pencils you just got are? And sometimes she doesn't know. So it's like, you know, some, some mentalities or some, I guess, what's the word I'm looking for? Personality types really need like that messy space to create in because Mm -hmm. it's all their inspiration is everywhere. Um, but there is that line between just messy enough and too messy. And it's hard sometimes to help figure out, figure out where that is for your kid because it might be different than where it is for you. Yeah. And, and we acknowledge that clutter chaos can be a real like emotional drain on moms or mental drain on moms. So it, you do have to find that sweet spot because we're not suggesting that you set your own like mental health side for this either. Um, right. Final thought, because this did not make it into our outline, but I'm sure, Megan, we feel the same way, is that any kind of a craft kit that is sold as a project, like looking at you lip gloss making kits uh, uh. or um, some beading kits. I will say we've we've managed to build a bead collection that's kind of multi-purpose, meaning you don't have to stick yeah. with one set. But anything that is sold as a maker crafty kit and for some reason between the ages of like seven and ten this is so rampant for girls especially to get as gifts those would have gone straight into a bin that's like ask mom first and also probably not if your younger siblings are in like it it had to be a very different uh arts and crafts space then everything else I talked about is very like mixed media like I said like you're gonna paint you're gonna draw you're gonna color Mm -hmm. you're gonna and that's how I preferred it those those kits were always a little bit frustrating for me and and the kids did them and it was fine but it was a very different setup cleanup and storage than everything else yeah I think for me the rule with those things was always like this has to be a one and done like we need to get it out and complete it Mm -hmm. If, if it's something we can get out and complete and be done with great. Otherwise I am not ashamed to say that sometimes I would cannibalize those kits. Like if they were a gift Mm -hmm. and, um, I, there was like maybe a bunch of beads, but I knew the kids weren't going to be interested in the craft itself. Cannibalize all the good stuff and throw away the packaging. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. (laughs) And as your kids get older, they're much more independent to do those things. So it's not always a, a headache, but, um, definitely a different consideration when just turning it over for like, here, let's, let's get crafty. Just, let's just throw this in the craft supply. Yeah, kit, exactly. It's the exactly. Yep. Okay. Well, let's move on to, we're going to talk about active play, both indoor and outdoor stuff. Cause we had requests, um, especially to deal with like bikes and scooters and all the outdoor stuff, but we're also in the middle of winter right now. So I think a lot of right. families have things like indoor trampoline, the little, you know, toddler trampolines and the tents and the forts and all that. So what do you, can you start us off with this big category? Yeah, I don't feel like I'm of very much help in this section because when my kids were in those stages, like we, that's not a big thing for us anymore. Um, but when we were there, I would just kind of let those things take over until I couldn't stand it anymore. And then I would move them into the place that they went to die, right? So like for me, that would be a less visible area. So let's pretend it's a trampoline mm-hmm. and it, for a while it's in my living room and, and then I can't handle it. So I move it into a room that's less visible, uh, maybe like a side room. And then eventually it ends up in the basement and then everyone forgets about it and it stops being used. And it's not even like strategic. It was actually more of me just trying to save my like sanity by getting it out of my viewpoint or out of my you know eyesight. And then it would just become like forgotten. And I, I think that is so dependent on the size of your house and mm-hmm. whether you have dedicated play space and how old your kids are. I think it's okay. Just to manage, I think it's okay to let your house be overtaken by stuff and then to no longer, I guess is my point. Like what you're doing today doesn't have to be what you're doing in three months and it's okay. So true. And, and think about it this way. If you are getting out a giant play tent or teepee or fort building kit, it's probably because you're stuck inside during a pandemic. So like it's probably serving a purpose and it's not because you wanted your living room to look like a campground. So if if it is serving its purpose, then I think we can set aside our decor aspirations for the day. And then you're right, Megan, it's also within our prerogative to set things right when it's time. Um, So uh, one of our listeners posted a picture of those giant cardboard bricks, which I think we've recommended as a great, a great indoor activity. Um, My kids definitely have the, had them, but that's another one that's really hard to store. We've done it um, like at the back of a closet before or in the garage. So A couple storage tips. It's funny, this category of things, we've had a couple play tents. We've had um, some fort building kits and some other large things like this. 
Um, and I usually keep them in their original packaging. And as you will find out when we get to board games and puzzles, I'm often I don't keep original packaging because I find it bulkier than what what is really required. But for this, I usually keep the original box, make sure we can know how to get everything back in the box and then put them kind of far away, like a linen closet has worked well or some kind of back closet or garage. And then when the kids want to get something like that out, Violet still, she's turning eight, but she still likes to turn the whole living room into a fort or get out some big thing like that. It's usually an opportunity for me to say, great, what other projects are midstream in the house right now that we can put away? Because for me to accept your uh, tent invasion, I'm going to need to have some other things put away. And so it's almost always like a, a little a little transaction there where if you want to get this yeah. thing out, then I think we can decide that we're done with the Lego area for today. Or I think we can decide to put away that board game that you guys swear you're still in the middle of, but nobody's actually played for three days. So I use it as a little bit of a, you know, encouragement to to get them to put other things away. But yeah, like you said, it depends on your the size of your house and where you store that stuff is just totally a functionality thing. But I think it might be helpful to think about when do I get these things out and what are the what are the parameters I need to feel sane about it? I love that. And I just want to mention those indoor play tents um, during the phase of my life that that was a thing. Um, I would often leave those out, but then I would make the kids put all the other stuff in the tent. Mm. So like at the end of the night, the room, because I really like to go to bed with a room that doesn't look like it's been destroyed and it would still have a tent in the corner, but all maybe all that big other stuff was inside the tent. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know, somehow that made it okay for me. Like not everything had to get put away as long as it was all stuff. It's kind of like the equivalent of being under the bed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, I can't see it. It's not there. It's visually out of the way. Right. Um, well, what about the outdoor stuff? Cause this is, yeah, this is, it gets more and more and more over the years. Well, and especially when you live in some place with seasons. So we, there was a thread on our Facebook in our Facebook community about this. And I, um, I admitted that like, to me, it just, it, it's very often that my garage ends up taking, like being taken over by bikes and stuff. And the, I park outside mm -hmm. so that like, and a, so many people around here do that. Like yeah. I could not, I live in an older neighborhood with small garages and it is very, very, very common for people to not park in their garages, even though we live in a snowy place where it's a pain to not mm -hmm. park in your garage. You got to make a choice. Yep. And old garages were not built for two cars and, you know, five bikes and yep. all that stuff. Um, sometimes it will live inside during the off season. So sometimes like the bikes and scooters and things will go in the basement or an entryway or a coat closet. Um, and sometimes you kind of have like this, these temporary solutions, like stuff in the yard with a tarp thrown over it. Or, um, I did have a gladiator system for a while in a, in a bigger garage and it was awesome. But here's the thing. It was a two and a half car garage. That's why it worked. Mm -hmm. If you don't have space in your garage, like if there's just not space, you can't magically make space. It yep. doesn't exist. So I wish I had more actual concrete advice there, but I think it's like figure out what matters to you and, and work around that. Yeah. I, I think my advice is going to be similar. I literally wrote in our outline that I think this is one of those areas that I, I don't have a hang up about. I'm not saying people do have hangouts. I, I don't mind being the house with a bunch of bikes and scooters leaning everywhere or stacked in the garage in the same way. I don't mind driving a dirty minivan. Like I just, it's just yeah. a very neutral experience for me, which is not like everything. Like there's definitely areas that I do feel more kind of controlling about, but not this one. So first of all, I guess I don't mind that we are overrun with things with wheels, but to your point about garage storage, I agree in, in the neighborhoods I've lived in, it's very common for one or both cars to always be in the driveway in the yeah. name of just practical storage. I've also lived in areas where adult recreational biking is very popular. So you're not only dealing with kids stuff, but um, our old Orange County neighborhood was right by these amazing mountain biking trails. And I am, I am not a biker and neither is Brian, but we were surrounded by people who, you know, biking as a family was like a really, you know, big pastime. So that takes up a lot of space. We did invest in some wall hanging stuff in the garage for some bikes and scooters. I will say it took complete parental assistance to get bikes down, even for my older right. kids. So it's like one of those things, like I said at the beginning, it, it, it didn't work as a way for the kids to put away their own stuff. 
One thing if I, it doesn't make your life easier, is it worth it? Exactly. And that's only, you, only you could answer that question, and, but. You know, yeah. it felt good, one, you know, every two or three weeks when we'd get all the bikes on the wall, right where they belonged, it just kind of had that satisfying feeling. But the real life was that they were just cattywampus most of the time. I do think it's cute. You can use painter's tape or electrical tape on your garage floor to create like little parking spaces. If you have a neighborhood or a driveway where your kids are just in and out all the time and during COVID, it's so good for kids to just kind of be able to do that. Then I think making little parking spots with tape on the ground could just be a way to at least the same scooters or the same trikes are going kind of into their spot each time. I think last week I mentioned that with with the big activity tables, it's not that you want one pushed up against the wall forever, but at least if you know which wall you're going to push it up against, it feels like it's in its place, if that makes sense. So yeah, totally. Sarah, when my kids were little, I was always pretty torn on whether to give them a daily multivitamin. I knew that modern kids diets have some pretty big nutritional gaps, but I also knew that most children's vitamins are basically candy in disguise. They're filled with sugar. They have all kinds of chemicals and preservatives in them. And I was like, why would I give these to my kids? Luckily, two dads recognized the problem and came up with a solution. Haya, the pediatrician approved, super powered, chewable vitamin. Haya fills in the most common gaps in modern children's diets to provide the full body nourishment our kids need with a yummy taste they love. Formulated with the help of nutritional experts, Haya is pressed with a blend of 12 organic fruits and veggies, then supercharged with 15 essential vitamins and minerals, including vitamin D, B12, C, zinc, folate, and many others to help support immunity, energy, brain function, mood, concentration, teeth, bones, and more. Your first shipment comes with a cute bottle that has fun stickers your kids can use to decorate it too. My kids always loved that. And we've worked out a special deal with Haya for their best-selling children's vitamin. Receive 50% off your first order. To claim this deal, go to HayaHealth.com slash MomHour. This deal is not available on their regular website. Go to H-I-Y-A-H-E-A-L-T-H dot com slash MomHour and get your kids the full body nourishment they need to grow into healthy adults. Okay. Board games and puzzles. I'm just thinking with our with our longevity in motherhood, how many board games and puzzles have come through? I couldn't even our doors. begin to tell you. Oh I my know. goodness! You guys are a big board game family too. So this is a fun one. Um, th- okay, I discovered a hack when we lived in our old house because we did not have any cupboard storage, no cupboard storage of any kind for this type of board games and puzzles. Um, And so I turned our front coat closet, which we did not need for coats because we were in Southern California. And I turned it into board game storage in a very unusual, unorthodox way. So what I did is I took almost every board game we owned and I took the pieces and small parts and cards out. And I, in some cases, I might've put them in a smaller Ziploc or used a rubber band but then whatever was whatever I, you know, gathered, I put in a gallon Ziploc bag and I punched a hole in the corner and I hung it over a coat hanger and put it in the closet. So if you picture that times 20, um, there were all these coat hangers and they each had a, ga- a clear gallon Ziploc bag, which you could easily see through. So you were seeing, you know, the little game pieces. If it was Candyland, you were seeing the rubber band around the cards and just the four mover pieces for the board. And then the boards after that, the boards were all flat and they lay really nice and flat. And I put labels on the outside. So, cause most of the game boards look alike when they're folded closed, I label them and I stacked them in this little stack, this drawer unit thing that we had down below. Um, it was a big project and it felt like a big commitment. Like, okay, <laughs> I am throwing yeah, away. How we're doing it yeah, now. I'm yes. Throwing away the boxes to board games, but it worked for five years. It worked. Um, I loved having the boards. The boards became so easy to store when you take away all that other stuff. You realize I don't need this giant box. I of course saved the instructions. Mm-hmm. Um, we'd, you know, the, the Ziploc bags would rip after a while and we'd get a new one, but really it worked really well for a long time. And I have done the same thing with jigsaw puzzles. Now, I didn't hang the jigsaw puzzles from the coat rack, but I did ditch all the boxes. And when I ditched the boxes, I would cut out the picture of the puzzle because it is helpful to see the, the thing that you're trying to make. But it would usually just be like, you know, a square of cardboard that I would tuck in the Ziploc bag. Um, and so all the puzzle pieces went in there and, a, and an image of what you were trying to build. And at one point when I had different puzzle levels, I even got as fancy as having kind of difficult jigsaw puzzles and easier ones kind of separated so the kids could easily grab what they needed. Um, 
And that worked well for us for years. I'll talk in, in a minute. I'll talk about we do have these really nice, big, deep cupboards in the new house and we've acquired a lot more board games. So I don't think it's for everyone. And it, it didn't end up being like now I do keep a lot of things in the boxes, but it worked forever and it felt a little like rebellious or something. But it was a great use of the storage that we had. I love that. It actually calls to mind, um, you know, in the library when they'll have like books on tape or yeah. like even sometimes full kits, like they'll have a book and yeah. a book on tape. And sometimes they'll even have like the headphones and stuff all in one yes. of those bags with like the durable bag with the little hangy thing. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yes. Yes. I don't know. I have, there's probably a real name for that. I can see that working so well. That's such a child accessible thing that makes little kids walk up and be interested in what's inside. Mm -hmm. Whereas when it's like all packaged and they can't see it, they're not. And um, I definitely always tried to keep our board games in a place that was easy to access. And I'll just say, you know, feeling your pain uh, as living in houses that had a, a variety of different storage options, some of which were like built in bookshelves, some of which were cupboards, some of which were closets. Like it's really hard to do that. Also board games do not come in the same size or shape boxes. No. It is very difficult to get them all back in the box without the box having a little bit of a cattywampusness to it, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So then you can't stack them because the other stuff starts sliding off the top. So I really, really like that idea. And I did not do that, but I would consider it now because now we play a lot of card games and those are in like tiny little boxes, mm -hmm. but then you've also got big, huge boxes and they don't all fit anywhere. They don't fit in the same place. It makes the the big boxes just kind of like are monster sized. And then the little ones just get lost. And, um, and I think there's a hang up about that because I will say that I think when we were kids, board game boxes were just better. Mm -hmm. They were, they were much more durable and the packaging wasn't so out of control. Now I feel like now there's just way too much going on in, inside every box. Um, but so for years, I've really clung to this idea that like, I would always use the original boxes, but most of the time they're too flimsy and cheap mm -hmm. or the organization inside is like too specific to like <laughs> it's the like, original takes unbox. an advanced degree to figure out it like does. which thing goes in this weird shaped plastic mold. Yeah. I mean, it looks fantastic when you first open it, mm -hmm. but then after that it's useless. Like little kids cannot figure out how to put it back in. So we did create our own storaging and packaging solutions. A lot of the time it just wasn't as nice as yours. And I really did still feel pressure, especially with a lot of those bigger games, like the more, I don't know. The ones that were like the, the throwbacks from my childhood. Mm -hmm. um, it was very hard for me to like throw out Monopoly until I finally had to throw the box away because it was like tearing apart. Yeah. And the pieces kept falling out. Yeah. So then I was like, OK, it makes more sense to put each thing inside its own little baggie and yep. stick it all inside of a big baggie. And you yep. can get even if a gallon size isn't big enough because some board games, uh, um, the board itself needs something bigger. You can go bigger. Like yep. there are bigger bag solutions out there. So I love all that. Yeah. Another thing it allowed us to do was have keep like with like when possible for things like egg timers and dice and mm. other little um, things like that, that we might I might have like a little tray or a little basket where if you need an egg timer or you need a pair of dice. Yeah, maybe it came with Yahtzee originally, but like, could it double for this other game? And it just right. kind of created like almost like a help yourself, a self-serve board game accessory like place. And that that helped. Um, and then another just recommendation I have is I don't know why it's so hard, even for me, not just the kids. When you've cleaned up a game, you've put it away. And then an hour later, you find like two little pegs or a, a, a stray card. Why is it so hard to go to the original storage location, open it up and put that thing where it goes? It's It seems impossible. So we have always had a little tray or a little miscellaneous basket, a lost and found, if you will for board game stuff. And it's, it's stored right where the rest of the board games are, but it takes the pressure off of like, where did this come from? Like, is this a, right. is this from the game of life or is this, so you just put it in the dice are dice, you yes, know what I mean? Exactly. Unless you're in Dungeons you just, and Dragons or something. You just so. put it there. And then the next time yeah. the someone gets out that game and says, Hey, we're missing one of the people movers for shoots and ladders. Well, here it is. It, it it went to the place where the lost things go. Do you remember that song from Mary Poppins Returns? The yes. Place? yes. So that's what mm -hmm. I think of it. It's the place where the lost things go. But at least you have a place where the lost things go. And that way it's like a little mini lost and found for game pieces. And for us, it's like a little tray and it sits right in the cupboard where we keep our board games. So wanted to throw that out there as well. Okay, Sarah, it is time for us to talk about books. 
And I know we are both big readers. I know we have kids who are a variety of, you know, have a variety of enthusiasm levels for, for books themselves. Um, but I think our, the way we feel about books as parents so often is what ends up being the driving force behind how books are stored and how we encourage our kids to read and all that stuff. So I just want to start with a few questions or like, I don't know, conversation starters to set, to set this up. Yeah. And, um, one of those is just the question, do your kids have bookcases in their rooms or are all books communal? And if you do have them in their rooms, what goes on those bookcases as opposed to what's out in the family area? I will say I have, each of my kids has a, like a cheapo folding bookcase in their bedrooms. I'm pretty sure all of them do now. And that doesn't mean a lot of their books even end up in there. I think I just wanted, I grew up with my own bookshelf mm -hmm. in my bedroom and I have great glee in my mind when I think back to being a little kid or even an older kid and being able to like go over to my personal bookshelf and choose a book to read that night in my bed. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And like knowing at any point, if I was sick of it, I could put it down and go get a different one. Like there was something about that to me that I really loved. And so I want my kids to have that at the same time. I had four boys who were all in pretty quick succession and most of them were, there was a lot of overlap yeah. between what one was reading and the other at the same time in the series that they were all into. So that got really, really tricky for a while. It's gotten a little bit better, but, and, and that is like an awkward stage. So some kids are growing out of certain books. Other kids are growing into them. Um, we can talk about how to manage that in a little bit, but I just wanted to like kind of put that out there that that's yeah. a thing. And when there's like a series that's becoming really popular, but all your kids want their own copy mm. of that book, um, that's another tricky thing that can come up, which I mean, sounds like such a like first world problem. Like, does every kid get a copy of Diary of the Wimpy Kid? But <laughs> a lot of those books also have like ways to personalize them. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're oh. kind of like journals. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, I'm sure, very smart, <laughs> a yeah. very smart marketing ploy. Um, but that was a thing for us for a while that everybody wanted to be kind of working on the same series or getting books from the same series. And then you end up with three books from the same, three of the exact same books. And, and then the other battle that is keeping library books, school library books and home books separate. And I've, I have been personally losing that battle for like my whole adult life now. So, um, so let's just talk about all that stuff. Yeah. You know, if we do have, communal and private libraries. How do we decide what goes where? What is the actual way we, you know, organize it all? How do we deal with kids reading the same stuff at the same time? I, it's a lot. It is. Do you have thoughts? I do have <laughs> thoughts. Um, on the question of kids having books in their room, I would say, yes, all of my kids have books in their rooms. And some of them, depending on our furniture situation, have had small shelves or some baskets, but I would say my general philosophy is to curate a smaller collection of books in their room. And it's almost like books from the communal family library migrate to the bedrooms as they, right. as they take one and read it and leave it on their nightstand and part of active management and everything I'm going to say about books is active management. Cause it's just something I, I spent a lot of time thinking about this. So it's never like every book is where it needs to be. It's almost, I'm picturing the books in my house as like almost little souls of their own and they, they move and they migrate. And then at some point we sort of bring them back to, to rest where they're supposed okay. to go, but they move again. So yeah, the kids have all had their own space for books in their room, but it's been relatively limited compared to the size of our overall library. And I just didn't have the same, um, overlapping interests that you did because my first two readers are so different in their interest levels and the types of books they were yeah. into. And so we always had a lot of books coming in, but we didn't have that diary of a wimpy kid problem. That, but I, I can see that being a problem for, for a lot of people. So yeah. And then I will have a tip upcoming about the keeping the library books separate, but um, yeah, that's, it is a lot. It is a lot. And I think that you're right about active management. I'm, I was just thinking about just recently, I walked through my house and was, because again, even having a communal bookshelf area does not solve these problems if you don't manage it. Correct. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because it, there's a, there's adult books in there too. And it, sometimes adult books have covers that look a lot like kid book covers, <laughs> which reminds me of the time Clara picked, like this plucked a memoir off my shelf and went in the bathroom and then came out a few minutes later. And she's like, mom, I don't think this is a kid book. And it was a memoir written by a friend of mine 
um, named Kieran Pittman. Uh And it has like dandelion, like it's like bright blue cover with like dandelions on Mm -hmm. the front. And Clara thought it was the kid book. And she she comes out looking very shaken That's <laughs> a so few minutes funny. later. So it's like it wasn't, you know, terrible. Yeah. It wasn't it wasn't like uh, like a, one of the flowers in the attic books or something, but it had adult content. Right. And it's not always easy to to like guide kids toward the stuff that's appropriate for them right now, unless you are really pretty clear about what you've got. You don't let stuff pile up. That doesn't need to be there. Like you just really yeah. have to rein it in. Yeah. No, you do. Well, I I guess I have a few concrete tips, and I've tried to make my tips things that you could do no matter like what your storage is, like how many bookshelves you have, um, and all that. Um, my first tip is about toddlers, and I just used baskets only when they were toddlers. Mm. Um, toddler books are weird shaped. First of all, some are mm-hmm. soft. Some have things sticking out of them, like tails. Some are big and fat, like board books, like they are not uniform at all. So you will not get the satisfaction that I get shelving a row of novels or poetry books that, right. you know, with toddlers. Second of all, lining books up on a shelf for toddlers is just an invitation for them to deshelve and wreck it. Um, yeah. So we did a lot of baskets in the bedroom, a basket in the family room. And it's also easy to put books away um, when, you know, they can help put the books back in the basket. And I did that all the way up through, you know, through preschool books. But I think as your kids go through different ages, thinking about the physical size and shape of books can maybe be more helpful when thinking about organizing rather than thinking fiction, nonfiction or Allegra's books and Reed's books. Like, I think there's such variety in the way books are literally physically shaped in those early years that you might actually get some storage ideas from that. Like here's all of our big hard board books that the baby can chew on. And then here's like a different basket. That's, you know, picture books that probably the toddler shouldn't have access to. So that's, that's one little idea there. Um, in terms of your library book problem, um, we just have a very small, um, it looks a little bit like those mid century magazine rack. It's like shaped like an X. It makes it, it makes an X shape. So Um, You can stack either magazines or books in it. And that's the only place where library books go when I find library books. Um, If a kid has checked it out from the library and they're reading it in their room, that's fine. But again, that comes down to active management as I'm looking at my library book checkout list pretty often and be like, hey, is this in your room? Like, let's find it and put it where it goes. And that was the same for school library books and public library books and also magazines and any books on loan from a friend. So it was one location for books that didn't belong to us plus magazines. And that has worked great, but it it does take some active management. Well, I think the thing that stands out to me about that is that you can't count on just the additional space or just the fact that library books look different. Like, I think I had this sort of like very delusional (laughs) idea that because book library books have a sticker, you know, on the binder and, Mm -hmm. and, uh, or on the, oh my gosh, but in the spine and often have a glossy cover that that would be like enough. That would be enough. (laughs) That would be enough. That's real hard when you're late for school and you're scanning (laughs) 500 picture books to find the one. (laughs) Or when it's like under your kid's bed Uh or whatever, you know? So we learned that the hard way when my kids got old enough that they were, um, checking out books, first of all, independently, where I didn't always have control over which books they got, like they were getting them Mm -hmm. at school. This happened with a few Calvin and Hobbes books that wound up in my personal Calvin, Calvin and Hobbes collection. And then much, much later, I was like, oh, that's why I had to pay the, the school $35 that year because mm-hmm. this book is ours now. But I think that external list that you check against is really, really important because you won't be able to just eyeball it and things won't stay where they start. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. So just having having a home base, but yeah, there's definitely another element to it. Um, if you have, I was going to say if you have little kids, but actually we still do this in my house. I think in every room or area of our home, there is a place where books can neatly be put away. And when I say put away, I mean that in like a temporary way, because maybe where they really go is in our big bookshelves in the living room. Mm. But if we're doing a quick tidy, um, in many rooms, it's just, they could be stacked on a little side table nicely, or it could, if you have little kids, it could be a basket in the corner. I'm such a fan of having books in every room and having books be just like a everyday part of our lives that it would make me sad if all books lived in one area of the house and we had to return them there after each use. Like I feel that way about board games and some other 
toys, but not about books. So I think thinking about when you look around each room, like where do the books go in this room? Do we have a little basket next to the chair or do we have, is there room on this table for a neat stack of books? And then I think you can teach your kids as you tidy up to help put books away in that way. And then reshelving them, I think like a librarian, like you don't reshelve everything immediately. You have that cart in the corner that yeah. kind of builds up and <laughs> then, and then you reshelve when you have time to do it, to do it well. So, um, and then I don't know, I guess it's, it comes back to, for books, for me, I spend a lot more time thinking about this and taking action than probably a lot of you listening. And just a reminder that that's okay. Books are like, it's a hobby for me. It's something I like to have a lot of involvement in. It's actually like genuinely enjoyable for me to, to read blogs about book lists and to put books on my library request list and then to bring a book home to one of my kids and find out they actually like it. Like I, those things I do a lot because they're enjoyable for me, not because I have to, or because it makes me a good mom or this or that. So I just think that's a good reminder. All of these organizational challenges, you, you don't have to have the same level of passion and commitment for each of them. You all saw my Lego, (laughs) my Lego disaster area, because that's not an area I'm interested in helping curate for my kids. It's just not. And it also doesn't drive me. It doesn't bother me that there's mismatched bins everywhere. So I don't know. I think that's just a general, like leaving us on that general note that you can, you can have fun with any number of these areas, Yeah, but, but it's a choice and it's a choice of how you're spending your time and energy. And I would hate to see anybody like really putting themselves through a lot of hard work that didn't feel fulfilling. Whereas the book thing to me feels fulfilling. So can I also say that I think this is one of those things where you may feel more or less fulfilled by being really involved in your kids' books at different ages and stages. Mm -hmm. Um, I was very slack when it came to toddler books because snooze alert. Yeah. Like (laughs) I would have been okay with my kids having two books when they were that age. (laughs) To me, those were things for them to throw across the room and bite on. And like, for me to pick up and go, yeah, like we're reading, but they weren't, they didn't do anything for me. They didn't make my writerly heart go pitter pat. It really wasn't until books started to have stories in them that I started to feel personally invested Mm -hmm. in, in not in my kids reading. I always wanted them to read and be exposed to books and they were in a variety of ways, but just like the books themselves got exciting for me a little later, Mm -hmm. like more school aged. And then you know, that middle, when I really, really remember becoming a really voracious reader was around seven, eight, nine. Mm-hmm. And so that age to me is exciting. And so yeah. like, I think that's another thing too. Like you may find yourself feeling a little more meh about it or with certain kids who don't care. It's really hard to feel excited about books when your kid doesn't care. And that that's like a whole different episode. I think we should actually yeah. do because it's like being, and I think we actually have maybe done an episode mm-hmm. about raising readers, but like also being okay with re- raising pe- kids who are ambivalent about reading mm-hmm. yes. it may also affect the way you feel about mm-hmm. organizing books. It's like, it can be a hobby, but sometimes it's only fun to have a hobby if other people are excited about it too. Yes. And if nobody else is, or they're not to the same degree, that can be a little bit of a bummer. So um, not for this episode, but another one. And I will say that even though my kids now are, um, two of them are in their twenties, I still have to regularly go through the house corral books Mm -hmm. and put them in the middle of the living room floor, just like I do with shoes. Mm -hmm. I have to do this this with shoes a lot because I have now four, you know, grown men basically with huge feet and I can't tell what shoes goes to who. And like, we've got shoes everywhere. And so I will put shoes out and have everyone gather and say, whose shoes are these? Mm -hmm. Do you want these shoes? So I do the same thing with books still to this day with my 21 and 23 year olds. I I have to say, guys, are these books your, remember these books? I remember. And they'll be like, no, those aren't mine. I'll say, yeah, I remember. Open it up. There's an inscription to you in the front. Okay. Now that we've established that this book (laughs) is yours, Isaac, do you want it? Right. If you don't, who does want it? Like we can't just be, we can't just let all the books pile up forever. And so that activeness, it really doesn't ever go away. I don't think. Well, I'm so glad you brought that up because the final, final thing I was going to say on this is you need to decide what your um, book give your, the exit strategy for you with books is in your home. Because I think those of us who love books feel like a weird, like a weird guilt or, or like we're, we're hurting somebody's feelings by, by passing books on. And I would just say, just like with the art supplies, you'll enjoy um, curating your shelves so much more. If you get rid of a little dead weight, I actually have a much easier time getting rid of adult books than kids books. 
because I have this vision of being the home that has a book for every child level. It's like a weird fantasy, but I have no problem getting rid of nonfiction books. Brian and I have read like biographies and histories and things we've read where it's like, I'm not going to, I am not going to read that again. If I wanted to, I could get it from the library. So my personal strategy is I get rid of almost all adult books, except for like literature things I'm holding on to from my literary days. Um, But modern adult books, I, I, they come in and they go out and I do mostly the library anyway. But if I buy something and read it, I give it away. Um, and then with the kids, I keep a lot, but I will pass on the ones that I just know are flashes in the pan or I know the next kid's not going to be interested in. So have have some kind of criteria for when and how you give books away, because you'll feel so much. It'll be so much easier and more enjoyable to organize the books that are coming in. And if your kids are growing they're you're going to keep acquiring books. So. Yeah, you go. You can't help it. Even if your kids are not growing. I mean, think about it. if you're a reader. Yeah. Think about how many books pass through your hands. Yeah, totally. In a typical year. So, yeah. Well, this has been really, really fun. And we <laughs> unless you think we've said all we have to say <laughs> about organization and taking care of stuff. Um, we have not said it all yet. Uh, we have one more episode already planned. It's going to be a more than mom coming up on the 24th of January. And we're going to be talking more about our stuff. Like Mm -hmm. I, my purse has been a disaster now for so many months and mostly just because I haven't taken the time to figure out what I want to keep and how to organize it all. So we're going to be talking about things kind of in that, um, I don't know, more in that, in that mom space, the mom space, our own stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. We also have to talk about masks. Remember? Cause we, 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 when we were thinking about this, we're like, now we have to figure out where to put the masks. So we promise to talk about that, um, on that Sunday, that'll be Sunday, the 24th. Um, also if you are on Instagram, make sure you're following us. Um, we're trying to, I am trying to share a little bit more of what we talk about in the episodes visually, because often we'll say like, Oh, I'll show or share a picture of this. And then I forget, but especially with these home organization uh, topics. I definitely want to show everybody my board game situation now in this new house because I'm. it looks pretty good. I'm pretty proud of it. And I can also show some of our art supply organization and maybe some books. So um, we're just at the mom hour on Instagram. And if you are not following us, um, it's a definitely a good visual, t- uh, like a visual, I don't know, companion to what you're yeah. hearing on the Tuesday shows. And one more thing before we go, we are going to be back in your ears this Friday with a special episode about how to approach your hopes and intentions and goals for 2021 in a way that doesn't make you feel bad. And, and by that, we mean like we, re- we know right now it's really hard to plan for mm-hmm. basically anything, but we don't want you to stop. Yeah. We don't want you to stop trying to mm-hmm. set intentions and goals because they're important, um, even if we don't always hit them. Right. So uh, we hope that this is going to be a really doable and an episode that's going to make you feel good and inspired. So look for that this coming Friday and we'll talk to you then. The Mom Hour is brought to you by partners like Chatbooks. Chatbooks makes it beyond easy to create beautiful photo books by importing your digital photos from anywhere. Instagram, Facebook, Google Photos, or directly from your phone. The books come in a variety of sizes with beautiful cover options and binding styles to choose from, and they start at just $15. Plus, we have a great deal just for our listeners. Use code THEMOMHOUR20 to save 20% off your purchase. Just download the Chatbooks app and use code THEMOMHOUR20 to save 20%. Hi, everyone. Megan here. Sarah and I would absolutely love it if you would hit pause right now, like right where you're listening, and leave the Mom Hour a rating and review. If our show has helped you feel a little more confident as a mom or a little less alone, this is one of the biggest ways you can thank us, and it really only takes about 30 seconds. If you're listening to Apple Podcasts, you can navigate to the Mom Hours show listing. So when you're in the episode you're listening to right now, click where it says the Mom Hour just above the play button, and then scroll all the way to the bottom, and you will see the ratings and reviews. We would love if you would leave us one as well. Thank you so much for listening.